Good morning and welcome to our Arts and Wellbeing Forum. It's wonderful to have so many of you joining us today. We are all joining from the many countries of our First Nations peoples and to welcome us to country here today, I would like to ask Uncle Alan Murray to join us online. Uncle Alan. Thank you, Adrian. Um, good morning, my name is Alan Murray. I'm the current chair of the Metropolitan Local Land Council and also I'm here to do the work on the country. I also want to acknowledge uh, my parents. That's where I get my heritage from. My mum's from Walgood. She's a Gubilaroi woman and also my father's from Kamragunja Mission between Echuca and Shepherd in Victoria. He's a Wiradjuri Yorta Yorta, stolen generation. One of those things about doing work in the country, we need to also need to acknowledge um, this land. I'm here in Maribel on Gadigal land and I know this event is happening was also in Gadigal and I want to pay respects to their elders, past, present and their emerging leaders as well. The thing about doing work in the country, we also want to acknowledge that a traditional work in the country involves smoking ceremony, a song, a dance, and also making sure that you understand the relationship between us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait people and the land that we hear. But more importantly, we know that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait people have been here in Australia for 40,000 years, 60,000 years, 120,000 years. And if you want to be part of our legacy, if you want to walk with, with us, we'll walk with you. And we also share in the knowledge about our journey, understanding our culture, understanding the, the land, and also the customs, the relationship, but more importantly, how we pass on our knowledge onto our next generation. And with that, I want to say welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you, Uncle Alan, for your welcome. I would like to acknowledge that I am joining today from Wurundjeri country, part of the Greater Kulin Nations. Well, these have been an exceptionally challenging couple of years, haven't they, for all Australians, especially those who work in our cultural and creative industries. COVID has taken a heavy toll here at home and around the world. It has affected us differently and for some in tragic and profound ways. While there is undoubtedly a greater sense of optimism being felt currently as restrictions are lifted and more Australians are vaccinated, as we look to the future with cautious optimism, I want to acknowledge that for many, this has been a deeply unsettling and difficult period. But with the future in mind, the Australia Council is delighted to be able to convene today's discussion on behalf of the Creative Economy Task Force which was established by Minister Fletcher as part of the government's COVID response. Today's discussion is very much a precursor to a summit of policymakers and advisers that we are planning to hold early next year in Canberra to explore how arts and creativity can make a meaningful contribution to policy to better mental health and wellbeing. Our original plan to bring people together this year has been disrupted by COVID but we wanted to keep the momentum going around the ideas we would like to explore in greater depth early next year, as well as take this opportunity to engage a wider audience as we build the conversation. Now I'd like to welcome the Chair of the Creative Economy Task Force and Joint Artistic Director of the Adelaide Festival, Rachel Healy, to say a few words and introduce Minister Fletcher. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Adrian. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Ghana land today and pay respect to Ghana elders past and present. I know that the Australia Council office is located on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation and note that we are gathering digitally from many nations and respect all past and present elders from whichever nation they come. In August last year, as Adrian said, the government established the Creative Economy Task Force to provide strategic advice on the creative economy, particularly as Australia rebuilds from the effects of COVID-19. The task force is comprised of 12 distinguished members with diverse expertise from across Australia and the cultural and creative sector. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has put pressure on the mental health and well-being of many Australians. The task force quickly identified this as a priority area to focus on, specifically how the cultural and creative sector offers wellbeing benefits for the broader community who participate in and engage with arts and cultural activities. We know, for example, that the arts have a role in promotion of health and in prevention, management and treatment of illness. But also how artists and arts workers have experienced high rates of mental ill health as a result of recurrent lockdowns, health restrictions and loss of employment during the pandemic. The task force has been very pleased to work closely with the Australia Council and other partners to develop this forum. Their research shows that people with high level of arts participation experience significantly better mental well-being than those with medium, low or no participation. We hope that the forum will generate momentum, greater recognition of the mental well-being benefits of arts participation and increased collaboration to embed the arts within other aspects of policy decision making in the broader mental health system. As Australia reopens, many health restrictions remain in place and it is really important to remember that our sector will experience prolonged impacts. It is also important to highlight how arts and culture can help members of the community to find meaning and joy as they also re-emerge into this new world, especially from activities that provide social inclusion. I look forward to hearing more from the speakers and the panels today, and I hope you will join me in welcoming the Honourable Paul Fletcher MP, Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, to provide some opening remarks. Well, good morning. I'm really pleased to be joining you at the Australia Council's Arts and Wellbeing Forum. This is a really important event, and I know that this topic of the connection between the arts and well-being and particularly although not exclusively mental health is something that a number of members of the creative economy task force are really quite passionate about i want to particularly acknowledge greta bradman who as well as being an opera singer is of course a psychologist and the focus that she's brought to this issue has been important for quite a number of others uh, have got a strong interest in this topic. So I do want to congratulate all involved in bringing this forum together. We know that mental health is a significant challenge for Australians. One in five Australian adults experience mental ill health every year and the economic consequences of that are very significant. That's why these issues are a major focus for the Morrison government. I'm really pleased that Christine Morgan uh, Chief Executive of the National Mental Health Commission uh, is participating in today's forum. Um, and of course, I also want to acknowledge Adrian Collette, uh, who is the Chief Executive of the Australia Council and Rachel Healy, Chair of the Creative Economy Task Force, uh, and all the other participants in this very important forum. I spoke earlier this year about my priorities as Arts Minister. And of the four priorities that I mentioned, there's one I want to focus on today, which is the importance of the arts being for all Australians. And we know that almost all Australians do engage with the arts. Some 98% of Australians engage with the arts in some way. And connection and well-being are significant drivers of people engaging with the arts. It is well understood that there's a positive connection between the arts or creative activities in the broad and assisting those who are experiencing poor mental health to recover from that. Uh, and of course, there's evidence going back to the 19th century uh, on that topic. It's also interesting that in the Australia Council's National Arts Participation Survey, 56% of respondents said that arts and creativity had a big or very big impact on their sense of well-being and happiness and help them in dealing with stress, anxiety and depression. Now, of course, as we know, over the last couple of years, we've been carrying out a giant unstructured experiment on living, for many of us, in isolation from others. The requirements of lockdown through the pandemic have meant that for almost all Australians, for significant periods, 
we've been unable to go about our normal routine. And a lot of us have been stuck at home and in some cases, depending upon our living arrangements, not seeing other people, at least in person, physically, for considerable periods of time. A survey done by the Australia Council back in April last year found that a third of Australians had engaged with an arts event online since lockdown had begun, and half of those gave their reason for doing so as improving their well-being. So this nexus between the arts, between creative endeavour and people's well-being and uh, sense of well-being is well established and it's one of many reasons why our government is a significant supporter of the arts and of creative endeavour. This year, the Morrison government will provide funding of over a billion dollars to the arts sector. That's an unprecedented level of support for the arts sector, reflecting, of course, a very extensive commitment to COVID-specific support for the arts. Indeed, total COVID-specific arts funding measures now stand at $475 million. Very, very substantial funding. And the centrepiece of that is our RISE Fund, Restart Investment to Sustain and Expand. And I am pleased that a number of the events funded under RISE do have a very specific health and mental health aspect to them. For example, uh, there's a multicultural comedy festival that's received over $660,000 to tour to regional locations across Australia in partnership with local mental health organisations. Um, or I could point to the Revive project uh, by Somebody's Daughter Theatre Company, $500,000 in funding under RISE to engage with disadvantaged youth in regional and rural communities in arts practice with a focus on mental health concerns and boosting interconnectedness. Or I could uh, mention the Lost City Music Festival, the focus on uh, young people, those under 18, hosted by Good Life Music Festivals with a significant mental health component. So in some of the specific projects we've been funding as part of our support for the arts sector to recover from COVID, to rise again, uh, we have had an emphasis on mental health, uh, an objective of leveraging the proven capacity of the arts and entertainment sectors to boost the mental health of participants and audiences. Of course, I do also want to acknowledge that this has been a very tough period for the mental health of arts sector workers. And I'm pleased that we've been able to commit some $40 million of funding through Support Act, the well-known and respected music industry charity. And with that funding, Support Act is providing crisis relief to arts workers, initially in the music sector, but they've agreed to broaden that to other parts of the arts sector, uh, helping people uh, who are facing great difficulties as a result of not being able to work. And we know, particularly in a sector where people bring such a passion to their work, that if you're not able to work, not only does it have dire economic consequences, you might not have the money for the rent this week, but it's also very corrosive of your sense of self-esteem and sense of purpose. And so for a host of reasons, I'm very pleased at the scale of support we've been able to provide through Support Act. So the subjects that you're engaging with today are really important. The basis on which governments provide funding for the arts are many and varied. But certainly one of those is the way that the arts can enrich all of our lives. The experience of going to, of participating in an arts event is an enriching one. And that means positive mental health outcomes, as well as all of the other good reasons why we might want to go and see a show. What I particularly welcome about this forum is that structured investigation of that connection between the arts and creative endeavour on the one hand and uh, health and particularly mental health of uh, both those participating but also those attending uh, in the audience uh, watching performances. 
I'll close with the observation that clearly the pandemic has been extraordinarily challenging for all Australians, but absolutely for all involved in the arts and entertainment sectors. But it has had, I think, some dividends as well. One of those has been advances in the use of digital approaches to delivering arts content. But I do think another benefit has been it's forced some clearer and more specific thinking about what the arts means to all of us, what benefits it delivers, and why there's a case for funding the arts, and why the carrying on of performance and creative activity is a very desirable thing. Perhaps it takes its temporary suspension for us to realise just how valuable it is to us. But I do think that's been something of a, a dividend or a benefit of this quite unpleasant period of the last year or two, that it's allowed us to recognise what we value and it's allowed us certainly to think about the many benefits that the arts bring and amongst those benefits is the positive spin-offs for health both mental and physical so I welcome the fact that there's detailed engagement on those issues today I hope that this is a very productive forum and I look forward to uh, it being the basis for uh, various uh, initiatives and actions in response to all the good things that are discussed today. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for your very encouraging remarks, uh, for your contribution, for your support of the sector. And there is something so important there about recognising the value of arts creativity uh, when you feel its absence in the extraordinary challenges of the last couple of years. Thank you again. And thank you, Rachel, for joining us today and for the ongoing and important work of the Creative Economy Task Force. It's now my very great pleasure to introduce Christine Morgan. Christine, as the Minister said, is CEO of the National Mental Health Commission and National Suicide Prevention Advisor to Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Christine, thank you for being with us and a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Adrian, um, and thank you in particular for your invitation to participate in this forum today. It's something I've been so looking forward to since we first met, however many months ago that was now. Look, I would like to begin also by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands upon which each of us are meeting. For myself here in Sydney, that is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, in particular, I would also like to acknowledge the very vibrant contribution that our First Nations people continue to make to our community and in particular through the lens of art. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to those of us who have a lived and living experience of the reality of mental illness, mental ill health and suicide. And today, as I've had an opportunity to think in preparing these, uh, these few thoughts about how we best bring together that intersect between the work that we do in our mental health and suicide prevention sector and the work that you all do in terms of arts and creativity. Um, it's enabled me, I think, to try and better understand what those points of connection are and how we can then draw upon those to actually enrich not only ourselves, but in fact, our whole society and dare I say it, um, our nation. So thank you to Minister Fletcher for his words and a special hello to all of my colleagues. Um, I know that you'll be speaking to a few of them through the, the panel today. Thank you also to yourself, of course, for being such a fantastic audience and for the contribution you make uh, to us. So perhaps if I could have my first slide up and I just wanted to uh, take you through today um, some concepts we have around a contributing life. I think this is a really interesting starting point for uh, the work that we do at the Commission and how we may try and intersect that with the work of yourselves. 
So at the very heart of what we do at the Commission is a concept that actually I think might resonate with all of you. Um, I think certainly it's one that you can well appreciate. All things creative, I believe, feed into it. So what is that concept? That concept is this one of a contributing life. Now, at first instance, you may think, where's the intersect between a contributing life and mental health and wellbeing? But this was a piece of work that was undertaken by the Commission in the early days of its inception. And Georgie Harmon, who will be participating with you on the panel, will well know it. And it really is looking at the fact that a key focus of us when we look at mental health and wellbeing is how we can ensure that everyone in Australia, everyone in Australia, regardless of their location, of their financial situation, their education, or indeed their ability to access services, are supported to live a contributing life. Now, why? Why would you want to look at what is a contributing life? I actually think that a very core component of our ability to be mentally healthy and well is for each of us to be encouraged to recognise, understand and then use that part of us which is unique. We all have a unique place that we can live on this earth. We all have a unique contribution that we can make and being able to find that, unlock it and truly engage in making what is recognised as being a valuable contribution underpins our mental health and wellbeing. I've seen that in particular as I've had the opportunity over the last two years to be more deeply engaged in suicide prevention. In fact, when we find ourselves at that very point of deepest, darkest despair, where all hope is lost, we truly have given up on thinking that we have a valuable contribution to make. The corollary of that, of course, is the way back from that, and perhaps the way to prevent it is for us to recognise the inherent value of that contribution. So as I unpack this a little bit, I'd like to do so in a way which also shines a lens on the contribution that comes from the creative arts sector. So let me go back to the concept itself. It proudly encapsulates that all people, all people can be supported to live a contributing life. We emphasise through that the point that living with mental health difficulties whether they be short term transitory or for some of us long term complex and a very deep reality of our lived experience doesn't preclude us from living a life that we can that can still enable us to find express and contribute our unique contribution. Each of us, irrespective of our mental health and wellbeing or our mental ill health is entitled to the same rights, opportunities and perhaps even expected health outcomes. It's very much about having a safe place to live, a place to call home, access to uh, meaningful activity, be it education or otherwise. It's also very much about having positive friendships and relationships, access to healthcare and services, and the freedom to live the life that we choose, regardless of our mental health. In fact, our work at the Commission and with our colleagues such as Georgie, is now extending into how the very strengths that can come from living with mental health challenges can in and of themselves be harnessed to further enrich our lives. And I just encourage us to think about that as we come through some of these particularly challenging times. You with your creative ability will harness that so well, I believe. So the concept is very much about providing real choice and re real hope. I'd go so far as to say that it's reframing our expectations for people to be able to be to be supported to survive, to actually say, no, that's not good enough. That's not good enough at all. We need to ensure that we are supporting people to thrive. What that means from a mental health and suicide prevention system reform perspective, it's, it's also about ensuring that all people can have equal access, affordable access to mental health treatment, care and support. That's probably a topic for another day. But the part that again comes back here is that core to it all is in, and this does very much feed into our current reform agenda, is that we have a person-centred approach. In fact, may I go so far as to say a person-led approach where the reality of our lived and living experience, including that of our mental ill health, is core to our life and shapes the way that we can go forward. What then is the contribution of the creative arts sector to this concept of supporting someone to have a contributing life? And I'm leading with this because I want to take this way outside just the impact of COVID. 
the contribution and the connecting points that we can have between mental health and wellbeing and the work we do with your creative arts sector go much more deeply than COVID. Yes, it will help us with COVID. I'll get to that in a few minutes, but this goes much more deeply. Um, you probably already know that in 2017, the all party parliamentary group on arts, health and wellbeing in the UK released a report outlining the powerful contribution the arts make to our health and wellbeing. And in fact, we've heard from Minister Fletcher about that sense of engagement we can have when we are participating in something led by, our, by yourselves. Um, in fact, and let me state it, it does keep us well, it does aid our recovery and in that does support us not only to have longer lives, but to live them better. But I think it goes deeper than that. I think um, the art and creative fields have a central role in helping to heal and feed our very souls. You provide ways to socially connect as individuals, communities, as a society. Your creativity broadens the connection touch points that each of us can have with people. You encourage us to unlock, unlock within ourselves our own creative ability. I can't paint for nuts, but I love trying it. And the leadership that you show enables me to unlock that very creativity in myself, to broaden the means by which I can communicate. Um, and it is absolutely critical when it comes to mental health and wellbeing that we have mechanisms to communicate because that is the only way we can truly express um, our thoughts, our feelings and our behaviours. I also believe that your field, the creative arts, arts field, acts as a cultural well-being barometer. You have a collective finger on the pulse of our society's emotional well-being. And at an individual level, as I've just said, art is a means of expressing our inner thoughts and where we sit within our own well-being spectrum. At the Commission, we live the reality every day. And you probably can't see it now because I know the, the slides are up on the screen. But behind me is a piece of artwork and such artwork adorns all parts of our commission. It is artwork which has been done by those with the lived reality of mental ill health. You know that researchers have studied the effects of visual art, for example, on the brain and found that it promotes health and wellness and fosters adaptive responses to stress. So, as I've mentioned just now, unlocking our own creativity is an important part of our well-being. A recent study by the Universities of Melbourne and Western Sydney found that creative art activity simply makes people feel better, especially during lockdown. More on that a little bit later. As I've said, you lead us in that way by showcasing how it can be done and by inspiring each of us to give it a go, helping us unlock that part of our individual selves. In so many ways, the creative arts are a critical contribution to the supports we can provide to people within this concept of a contributing life. The current mental health reform agenda acknowledges that mental health and wellbeing are impacted also by what we call the social determinants, our financial housing, employment security, and our personal safety. But they also include, going back to this concept, our ability to realise our unique contribution. The United Nations has declared 2021 to be the International Year of the Creative Economy for Sustainable Development, where the creative industries have been specifically singled out as a key to global recovery. I believe that those creative industries will not only lead to global recovery, but to help us realise our global potential. Just briefly, as I know I've taken up some time now, um, and I'll just go to the next slide. I'll touch on a point that Minister Fletcher also um, was talking about, which is the role that you have in helping us to recover from the pandemic. There's absolutely no doubt that the pandemic has had a significant impact on all of us. Those of us in the broader community suffered very much from our lack of ability to connect uh, with the beauty, the stimulation and the escapes that you provide through theatres, concert halls, art galleries, cinemas and live festivals. How much more each of you must have suffered and perhaps still are in not being able to fully express and share your gifts. I can only hope that the darkness and challenges of these last 21 months can in their own way provide input for each of you in your ongoing creative work. As we move into this uh, point of recovery as a nation, I believe the creative arts has a pivotal role to play in healing. 
you will be the ones who can help us to see and appreciate what we have been through, how it's changed us, and what are some of the obstacles and opportunities that lie ahead. I suspect we've been changed, not just as individuals, but as a society. Your creativity is essential in helping us to make some sort of sense of all of this. The concept of art and, creat and creative sectors helping us to heal isn't new. And from those tiny productions helping to ease the trauma of battle to that huge concert for national bushfires, we've seen the benefit of that in the past. So, as I say, you make a vital contribution to our ability to live a contributing life. And now even more so, you make a vital contribution as to how we can deal with the ongoing psychological distress and anxiety that so many of us are experiencing and feeling. To harness your contribution, all portfolios across all levels of government, as well as industry and society, need to be aware of it, its importance. Creative arts in all its forms need to be strengthened, supported and supplied within education, employment and social services. The way you provide social connection, imagination and inspiration are in fact irreplaceable. I hope that we can work together in the coming months and years to help ensure your role as an essential cog in our collective and holistic approach to emotional and social wellbeing continues, regardless of social and economic shocks like natural disasters and the pandemic. May I though, in closing, encourage the importance of each and every one of you taking the time to invest in your emotional um, and mental health and wellbeing. It is always so challenging to take that time to invest in yourselves. But you've heard today how important you are to the rest of us. So please look after yourselves. We acknowledge the tremendous distress, trauma, shock that so many of you have experienced individually, but also through the lens of your friends and colleagues and your family sector. So please take that time to heal yourselves. In healing yourselves, you will broaden the way in which we can learn how to heal ourselves. And as I conclude, I think that you have a role not only in helping us make that recovery, but if we are truly as a nation to harness the potential of going forward, each of us must be our most well when it comes to our mental health and well-being. And to the extent that you enable us to do that through our creativity, you're making a vital contribution to us not only recovering, but realising the potential of the future that lies ahead. So I look forward very much to working more closely with you as a sector and finding those ways whereby helping you shine, we can all of us in society individually, in society and as a nation shine. Thank you very much. Christine, thank you so much um, for those important insights, for your encouragement, for your understanding of um, the arts and creative sector and for the principle of a contributing life. Uh, if I might say, when I first spoke to Christine, uh, I was calling to try and persuade her to be part of this work and this thinking, instead of which I realised she was a leader in this work and this thinking when it comes to um, the importance of arts and creativity on our mental health and well-being, and that in itself was so encouraging. So thank you for that contribution. There is much to think about and work from, from what you've said. And we really do look forward to our engagement with the National Mental Health Commission as we progress our work. Now it's time to hear from our panel of experts so I'll leave you in the hands of our moderator, Faye Akindayeni, partner and Melbourne office head of the strategic communications firm, SEC Newgate. Thank you, Faye. Thank you, Adrian. I'm Faye Akindayeni and I'm a partner at SEC Newgate. Today, it's my great pleasure to facilitate our panel of industry experts to discuss the positive effects of arts and creativity for mental health and well-being. 
and the important potential for the arts to help address a major policy change. Everyone on this call already understands the importance of the why, and as we just heard from Christine and the Minister, um, around the role that the arts play in wellbeing. The conversation we're about to have will be broadly ba separated into two parts. A discussion about the what. So the what do we know? What is the existing work, the projects and the knowledge? And most importantly, the how. What can we do? The policy challenges and the possibilities. Joining me today are a panel of industry experts who are just, whenever we've had conversations prior to this, have just been a joy to talk to. And I'm very excited about the next hour and a half and a bit. First Nations cultural practitioner, Mary Ann Wobke. We also have joining us opera singer and registered psychologist, Greta Bradman, CEO of Beyond Blue, Georgie Harmon, and the CEO of the Australia Council, Adrian Collette, AM. Can I kick off by giving you a little bit more information about Mary Ann? Um, let me introduce for you to, you to her properly. Mary Ann is a Girame woman from Northern Queensland who was born on Waka Waka land. Mary Ann is a trained nurse, midwife, working specifically on birthing practices and trauma recovery. As a prophet, as a professional artist, she graduated with honours from Queensland College of the Arts. And Marianne has brought together a practice called perinatal dreaming. Perinatal dreaming is a process for working with women, their babies and families to support them to birth on country with the cultural rich and supportive and safe practices. This may not mean physically birthing on country, but a process instead that ensures all birth practices are culturally safe, using art as a tool for empowerment and expression. Marianne was the 2021 recipient of the Australia Council Ros Bauer Award for Community Arts and Cultural Development. Welcome, Marianne. Thank you, Faye. I, I appreciate those kind words. Uh, I'd also like to make an acknowledgement um, of the land on which I'm coming to you today, which is Turrbal and Yagara country. I'd like to acknowledge Uncle Alan Murray for his beautiful welcome to country and um, the words of the Honourable Paul Fletcher and Christine Morgan and Adrian Collette. I'm very grateful to be here. Coming to you um, today as an Indigenous midwife, I, I could not be more honoured and privileged. Thank you. Mary, I'll, I'll move on and I'll introduce our, our second panellist, Greta Bradman. Greta is a registered psychologist, consultant, investor, researcher, writer, broadcaster, speaker, performing artist, overwhelmingly talented. She consults on organisational culture, mental health and wellbeing strategies particularly around implementation and evaluation, especially in the tech and performing arts industries. The clinical practice focuses on values-based decision-making, performance and anxiety. Get, Greta presents Weekend Brunch on ABC Classics, so she may be familiar to quite a few of you. And alongside extensive classical singing work, she's released four number one solo albums. She's a trustee of the Arts Centre of Melbourne, she also sits on their foundation board, as well as the Alfred Foundation Board and the Australian Mental Health Prize. She's a member of the federal government's Creative Economies Task Force. Welcome, Greta. Great to be here, Faye. Next up, we have Georgie Harmon. Georgie has a significant and broad ranging leadership policy service delivery experience in the community, public health um, and private sectors. Georgie was appointed as the CEO of Beyond Blue in 2014, where she has led significant expansion of the efforts and results in service innovation, suicide prevention and digital solutions. Previously, she helped set up and was the deputy CEO of the National Mental Health Commission, providing independent advice to the government on reforms. And we've seen some of that work as discussed, uh, discussed earlier by Christine. From 2006, 2012, Georgie also um, had national responsibility for mental health, suicide prevention and substance misuse, cancer and chronic disease policy and programs as a senior executive in the Commonwealth Department of Health. She led the development of significant whole of government mental health budget packages 
and the strategy and development of legislation to introduce plain packaging of tobacco products in Australia, a world first. Georgie has also led national reforms to lift Australia's organ and tissue donation rates and worked in the HIV AIDS sector in Australia and the United Kingdom. Welcome, Georgie. Thanks so much. I'm so excited about this discussion. And uh, last we have, but not least by any sense of the word, is Adrian Collette. Adrian, as you know, is the Chief Executive of the Australia Council, and prior to that, he was Chief Executive of Opera Australia, one of Australia's largest performing arts companies. He's also worked in book publishing for over a decade, including managing director of Read Books. His previous role as Vice Principal Engagement at the University of Melbourne include the oversight of the university's museums and galleries and its many art sector partnerships. He served on the Australia Council Board since 2013. Welcome, Adrian. Before we, um, <laughs> this it wouldn't be a wouldn't be a 2021 moment without as you're on mute moment, Adrian. So thank you for breaking that that ceiling. Um, just a quick reminder for those who haven't already, even though you've seen it, please do download the interactive live app. That's the best way for you to be able to participate in the live Q and A component, and it hate for you to miss out. So let's get started. As I said, the first part of this is the conversation more about what. What do we know? What are the existing work, projects and knowledge out there? Marianne, can I start with you? How do the arts positively impact mental health and well-being? Broad question, lots of opportunity in the answer. Thank you, Faye. Uh, I, again, I'll refer back to the fact that that um, I'm an Indigenous midwife, so I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone. I'm most comfortable when I'm with um, with birthing women and particularly in um, intimate uh, situations. So speaking on a public forum like this is, um, is uh, certainly a different experience for me. Uh, one of the things I know about the impact of, of arts on mental health and wellbeing is that we are by nature creators. Um, at the moment, I feel we're in the midst of a huge paradigm shift from the disease model and um, often what we experience as a survival state of being um, and arts and creativity, partnerships and collaborations with the creative industries are going to weave the very fabric and the foundations of well-being. And I would go so far as to say that you cannot experience well-being if you're not engaging with the arts and being proactively creative in your life. I think that we need to broaden our definition of what arts and creativity means in relation to well-being. Our experience of creativity, as Christine Morgan reminded us, um, is it, it needs to be holistic, unique, individual and self-determined and integrated into every aspect of our lives, culture and communities. Creativity and arts shifts us into and supports an ecology of well-being where we encounter, encounter feminine hormones that promote relaxation, connection, bonding, elation, ecstasy and bliss. We feel abundant, inspired, connected, organically ethical, empathic and compassionate. Our hearts and minds become coherent. Our imaginations are activated and we are inspired to create a future aligned with our dreaming. Our bodies are primed for growth and repair. New neural pathways are fired and wired. These elevated emotions and capacities are our superpowers and they are inspired by creative industries and um, become the very foundations of who we are. However, they're blocked by hormones of survival that split and separate us from our creative nature. When we're locked into a survival mindset and divorced from our creativity, it's not time to create. It's not time for repair or growth or to bond and connect. We've experienced this uh, most profoundly over the last 18 months. The in individual who's in survival mode, who's stressed, has a tendency to focus exclusively on themselves, their environment, linear time and their survival. Brains 
um, becomes to archive and download material from the past, going to worst case scenario to facilitate survival. These highly addictive arousal states can imprison us in a reality where our perceptions of the world can become corrupted and toxic. We see our reality through the lens of depression, anxiety, aggression, violence, hostility, competitiveness, jealousy, loneliness, separateness, and isolation. We've become unbalanced. And we, reduce, we risk becoming reduced uh, to a series of symptoms that label individuals as broken or dysfunctional, rather than embracing that breakdowns are an opportunity to support growth, transformation, and breakthroughs to a greater sense of well-being. All of this is facilitated and grounded by the arts. Wow. Um, how do you know that the arts is having that impact, that facilitation? I guess um, how I would answer that is we're profoundly privileged here in Australia to have access to the, the longest living culture on the planet, uh, into which Uncle Alan Murray just welcomed us, generously sharing this opportunity with us this morning. Um, this culture of wellness and well-being um, has been maintained, but also evolved and flourished for an estimated 70,000 years plus. This provides us with considerable evidence uh, and a prototype for well-being. Aboriginality uh, in its traditional context integrated uh, arts and creativity into the fabric of life. So to stay well, to evolve, to grow, uh, to flourish, we need to not only experience the arts through others, but um, intrinsically through our own dreaming. So when I'm with a client um, and encouraging them to brace their creativity, uh, it's about employing dance, um, art, uh, creativity, singing, movement, uh, all of these creative factors into, into their everyday life and well-being, that they're in this hormonal state um, that shifts into a state of elation through that experience. Collectively, we can experience that by engaging the arts. We um, can have an experience collaboratively of, of what it means to share that, that joy and those elevated emotions and sharing others uh, in their creative process. Thank you. That's, that's fascinating. It's actually a good opportunity to then I'll, I'll go to you, Georgie. These are tough times. And as Marianne just outlined, there is potential in the environment for some incredible negativity. What have you seen in the arts in terms of playing a particular role in preventing poor mental health in the first place? Oh, look, there are so many facets to that. And I, but I think, I think it comes down to, to the fact that I've worked in, in the mental health um, sector for about a decade now, just over a decade, and there is not a day goes past that I don't talk to someone who, of course, talks about, you know, their treatment path and all that kind of stuff, but quite often the most important part to their staying well and indeed recovering is the other parts of their lives. The, the parts of their lives that take them into community, the parts of their lives that lift them outside of themselves and allow them to express themselves, whether that's through singing in a local choir or, you know, painting or dance or, you know, whatever that might be. So the evidence is absolutely unequivocal, both from a research perspective, but importantly, from a lived experience perspective. For decades, this is what people who live with mental health challenges have told policymakers, people like me, is that yes, of course, we need a really robust, function, well-functioning mental health treatment sector, but we also need to recognise the other parts of our lives that bring us joy, that connect us, that, that help us to express how we feel when actually words seem too hard or, or not quite enough. Um, they can help 
the, the arts and creative industries can help heal us. Um, they give us a sense of social connection and community. And that's absolutely what I've seen and witnessed um, every single day in my work um, over the last 21 months is, is that we, we have to think differently about the policy responses, the structural responses, the integration between sectors, if we're going to keep people well and to help them to recover. Does that connect to that, you know, a phrase you often hear about social and cultural determinants of health? How might the arts fit into that? Yeah, so so I was reading some stuff um, that the World Health Organization obviously focus a lot on social determinants of health. And I so was reading some really interesting stuff the other day that, um, that, that brings together a whole bunch of research from around the globe and shows that social determinants of health can actually be more important to health outcomes than the healthcare system. Um, and in fact, account for up between 30 and 55% of health outcomes. So just think about that. When we think about mental health, we always think about the health system, the mental health system, clinical practice, the biomedical model, when in fact, the majority of our, our well-being and, and mental health outcomes are probably generated from outside of that healthcare system, as important as that healthcare system is. So, you know, we need to be thinking about the conditions that we're born into, that we grow in, grow in that we work in, that we learn in, um, that we live in and that we age in, um, and, and really kind of build into our policy and structural responses, uh, the rich tapestry of our lives, the kind of contributing life that Christine talked so eloquently about. Um, and all of that goes also to equity and to inclusion, um, to, to economic factors. Obviously, housing, you know, safe place to, to call home. I, I, I often talk about, you know, safe place to call home, um, something meaningful to do, something that gets you out of bed in the morning, and a date on a Saturday night, feeling loved, feeling connected, feeling part of something. Um, so, so you know, again, like this is, we are at, a, I think, a really important point where, as the Minister said, as Christine has said, as Marianne has said, we, we cannot go forward in the same way. We have to think about how the art sector needs to become inculcated and embedded in the policy responses going forward. You know, we cannot just keep thinking about mental health as a biomedical problem. Thank you. Greta, as a psychologist, in your view, what do the arts bring that the health system might not? Oh, Faye. Good question, massive question. Um, I, I reckon, you know, the, the current health system, it tends to focus on, on treatment of mental health and uh, mental health care needs, uh, as opposed to thought of predominantly with this treatment lens in one way or another. And I think what the COVID context has really brought home is that mental health and wellbeing are relevant for everyone all the time, that our mental health and wellbeing is impacted on by our context and our environment and that um, having a buffer in, in place when stresses arise is, is really important so that we can contribute productively to our family and our workplace and our community and our economy. And as others have already touched on, in, in some ways the arts is one way to expand out the health system, to really become coordinated around social determinants, as Georgie put it, as well as looking at uh, treatment as well. And, you know, one of the core components of being human, of, of our mental health, and one of the core components of the arts is our capacity to express and process and sometimes sit with our emotions. And the arts is sensational at allowing us to do those things. As uh, Christine Morgan said, as a nation, we, we are shifting to see mental health and well-being as about living a contributing life, about thriving and not just surviving. And the arts can really help with that. Something Marianne touched on um, about how the arts can help us lean into a space where we feel safe. And she mentioned hormonal states and their impact on how we feel. And there is a vast evidence base uh, made possible in part thanks to improvements in um, neural imaging techniques that would suggest that, for instance, listening to music we love promotes the release of the neuropeptide oxytocin or the love hormone. So we get a release of the feel-good hormones as, as, as well, serotonin and dopamine. Quite literally, the arts can change our brains and make us feel more connected to one another 
and make us feel better within ourselves. So I'd say what the arts can bring is an approach to mental health and well-being that can exist alongside the existing treatment-based approaches in the health system, as well as broadening that out. It can really meaningfully contribute both to individual treatment and population level mental health for all Australians. And I'd also say the substantial evidence base that Minister Fletcher touched on in time, it has the potential to reduce the overall burden on the health system. So truly a win-win. So in essence, the evidence base would suggest that the arts can fill gaps around population level support for good mental health to help us lead contributing lives, as well as providing treatment options that work as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, also, I'd just like to point out um, there's over 700, 928 people on who um, joined us this morning. So thank you very much for that. And I think it just reflects the very clear um, importance people have put on this issue. Uh, also, for members of the, uh, the panel, do jump in and ask each other questions because I know there's uh, no hesitancy on your part normally. Every other time we've we've connected, it's been more like a wrestling match than it has been a, a polite conversation. So overcome your politeness. Um, while you're thinking of the next grilling question, I'll just, uh, Adrian, just come to you and give a very broad question. What impacts have we been witnessing, uh, particularly in the last 18 months? What has been the, um, the highlights and the lowlights from your perspective in this area? Well, I think there is a potential highlight and I'd like to get to it. I mean, the most obvious impacts we have been witnessing uh, from an Australia Council perspective, of course, is within the sector itself, within the people we work with day in, day out, we invest in because we believe passionately in the work they do. And the Minister has mentioned it, Christine has mentioned it, we're all aware that we could not have had a more challenging 18 months uh, and we have been trying to save as much of the furniture as we can so we have stuff to go, to go on with and the minister did mention it but I want to really acknowledge and pay tribute to so many of the organizations including the Australia Council that have worked so hard to sustain artists and artistry and particularly support that um, I I'm a member of the creative economy task force together with Greta and Rachel and we had a wonderful discussion with Clyde Miller, the CEO of Support Act, very quickly taking their expertise invested in by the federal government to deal uh, with specific issues and applying that expertise to a broader uh, a broader part of the sector. It was no small thing to do and they've done it very effectively and superbly well. Um, and we're all aware of, of the very difficult stories but but the other thing that's been going on, as I've said somewhere else, you don't know what you've got till it's gone, <laughs> with apologies to Joni Mitchell or whoever it was. And that gives us something to really build on for the future. This discussion couldn't have the same intent 18 months ago as it has now and policy potential that it has now. So, you know, we, I was reading the research of the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and in August 21, two in three Australians, something over 65% thought life had gotten worse or much worse. And so through COVID, we know that this critical policy challenge has suddenly got much more urgent, has gotten worse or much worse, and is coming down the track at us, even as we open up. So in looking for something positive to say, the big story that's been happening underneath in the last 18 months is that organisations are turning to arts and creativity as having many answers to the challenges that COVID in a stealthy way has exposed so many weaknesses in our structures and societies and this is a big one. Um, and this is underwritten as we might talk about later by the Productivity Commission report but I think this is the really big potential news coming out of the last 18 months, that, that we have something to work with to really talk about arts, culture and creativity in quite a different way, uh, and particularly when it comes to policy development. Thank you, Adrian. And actually that leads quite nicely to a question that I, I think I'll pose to you, Georgie. 
Um, we all know that in government, there's the three big areas. There's the policy, the program, and the evaluation. We've got a great question from one of the um, audience. We're talking very much about the intrinsic value of the arts. I'd be really interested to hear about how we can effectively measure and report the arts impact on health and well-being, particularly for smaller organisations or independent artists. Yeah, look, I'm not an evaluation expert, and I, maybe Greta's um, uh, or even Marianne can add to this. But but look, to me, um, we we spend too much time focusing on academic driven research. I mean, as in, as in, sorry, I'm not I'm not against academic driven research. It's very important, but actually, um, the voices of those people who are who use services who need services, who benefit from services, who, who and supports, um, their voices have to be embedded in evaluation uh, as a, an absolute given, because that brings a richness um, and actually often a quite a different dimension to our learnings from what works and what doesn't. And, you know, it's something that, um, you know, we're having a live conversation about in the mental health sector at the moment is how do we actually measure what works? And at the moment, quite frankly, we've got a system that often doesn't work for the people it's designed for. Um, and uh, and we don't, quite often don't build that feedback into continuous improvement or even dump and replace of existing um, support structures. So, so I think, you know, both the qualitative and the quantitative, both the academic driven and the lived experience driven research and evaluation outcomes can come together in a beautiful whole. Um, and actually, you know, one of the, 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 the really important things that we do from here on out is the mental health sector and the arts sector need to collaborate better together to actually bring that data together and present it to, to decision makers because there is an irrepressible um, and I think irresistible moment that we have right now. Um, but I, but look, I'm really interested in what others have have, have to say on this. I'm I'm not an expert in in this in this field. Can can I jump in? Uh, I don't know what the etiquette is here, but as you Please. said, we're a chatty bunch. Um, uh, I think there 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 is no shortage of evidence. You know, the research has been in for a very very long time. The Australia Council's contributed to it. Universities consider, uh, contributed to it, though I do take Georgie's point. Immediately after this, my my colleague Kristen Cornell is Cornell is is working with three of our partner universities to talk about how we use the evidence that's being created to try and influence and affect policy. So that evidence base, both here in Australia and other parts of the world, really really does exist. But I think to Georgie's point. Uh, if we think this is important in the sector, we've got to get better at telling our stories. Uh, straight after this forum, we will be posting, I think, nine or ten uh, small videos that we've made with arts organisations working in place on the ground, creating this kind of positive impact on mental health and well-being and physical health and well-being. And again, I think this is the beginning of starting to take advantage of, of this opportunity. But, but those stories, those stories by people working in place, which is one of the challenges, this doesn't happen in abstract. You've got to have policy settings that allow this to happen in place uh, are incredibly powerful. And this is the time to be telling them. Faye, is there time for me to add one? one other element to this, do, um, this conversation. Do. You know, what, what I would add to this is um, I'd say that, you know, yes, I suppose there's the, there's the qualitative and the quantitative, but over and above that, I would say um, to Georgie's point around, I suppose, more industry-driven uh, feedback and evaluation versus more academic, I'd say what we really need is to ensure that we get uh, feedback that's good enough that is in small bits that can actually drive and inform change in an iterative way on the ground. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be great. You can use even a, you know, a tool like one of the, the free, I'm not sure what the etiquette is, here is around, you know, suggesting specific platforms. So I shan't, but, you know, there are free survey um, creation platforms where you can go and create a survey and just don't worry about getting it exactly right if you can actually capture some of that data. But I think at the industry level, 
what we measure is what matters. And that's not to say that um, it matters before we measure it, but it certainly does once it's measured. So I think, you know, as a sector, we need to get better at bringing people together in the room, and that um, includes arts and mental health practitioners. And I would also say um, economists are amazing. And, you know, what they can add to this conversation in terms of what we're measuring and what we're synthesising and what we're bringing together is, um, is really important. And I, I, I have more to say on that, but I'll shelve it for now. No, that's gold, actually, um, Greta. And Marianne? Um, I'd just like to say I, I agree completely with everything that you said. Um, and from my work at such an intimate level, uh, the way that I evaluate if um, what I'm doing is effective with my client is they'll, they'll turn up again. And I think that's um, a really important thing to note that um, you might have the most fantastic philosophy and uh, information to share with the client, but if you don't engage them, if you can't meet them where they're at and they don't come back again, uh, it's an epic fail. And um, the, the way I evaluate how, how I am with a mother when I'm with a mother is really from a grassroots level. And this takes me back to my early nursing and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If they're in survival mode, if they're homeless, if they're hungry, if they're in imminent fear or danger, um, then my application of well-being to them is meeting them where they're at, um, letting them lead me and providing them with the resources that shift them into an ecological environment where they trust me and we can move forward. Um, Greta, you talk beautifully um, about the uh, hormonal um, ecology that supports that. And I think that's where our evaluation needs to start um, is with the individual in front of us, focusing on their strengths, focusing on solutions, letting them know that they're not broken and that you're not there to fix them. You're there to journey with them, to um, experience their transformation with them in the moment. And that's when I really start to feel excited about the efficacy of the arts and creative industries, because from that engagement, that intimacy together, I can lead them into um, a community where they can receive and contribute. Marianne, what you're talking about there seems to be the a, a practical representation of what Christine had said earlier, was that person-centric or person-led approach. Correct. But I would imagine for a policy um, person that would there'd be a lot of discomfort in that it's not a whole how do you roll out something on a person centric which is a whole of system approach how do you find that common ground is a big challenge georgie if we move into the second part of the conversation a little bit more and we've already touched on a bit what can we do what are the policy challenges and possibilities if you look at that ideal situation that mary able to create in terms of her intimate relationship with um, the people that she's working with how might we strengthen links between the arts and positive well-being as at a policy level that could deliver that at scale yeah look I, I, it's again that we are at a really pivotal moment in the sector we've just had the in in the mental health world we have a review of the system about every 18 months and we've done that for about 20 30 years and all of those reviews and commissions of inquiry say the same thing that the system doesn't work for the people um, that it's designed, supposed to be designed for, that it's not linked to the rich tapestry of their lives, that it's about doing things to people at the point often that they are in crisis or, you know, you know, pretty unwell. So, so to me, um, and, you know, the, the Productivity Commission has really, really, again, reminded us and policymakers about the importance of building a system around people not around where providers are or where services are, uh, and actually really listening to the voices of lived experience and the expertise of that experience in terms of, of informing how decisions and policy is formed. So, so what does that look like? Uh, basically, we, we've, we've got a, a government so negotiating a new national agreement for mental health and wellbeing, or national health and suicide prevention currently. It's supposed to pop up the other end of those negotiations this month. 
Um, we think that that's going to be a pretty high level principles based document and be supported by a number of bilateral agreements. But I think one of the things that government is very cognizant of is the need for structural reform and the need for governance reform so that we have the right people and the right structures sitting around the table contributing their voices to the value to not only the development of policy but also the measurement of performance and the outcomes that, that the system provides so i think there is there is a moment here where the arts sector the arts and creative sector actually needs to almost force its way to that table and I think you've got a critical friend in Christine Morgan and the National Mental Health Commission, which, you know, whose primary job is to yeah, provide independent advice and to monitor the performance of the system. And I think we were all very encouraged by, by Christine's words there today. The challenge will be making it simple enough and creating the, the visible pathways for, for, for departments and ministers to make decisions with. So um, things like social prescribing, things like, you know, um, uh, arts prescribing, which which is being done um, at scale in places like the UK and Canada. We need to start really showing what that could look like, how that can sit within primary care, um, how that can actually be measured in terms of outcomes um, to be fed back into a national performance scorecard. Um, and maybe start that, you know, in, in, in a place based approach um, where it's community led and community driven um, and that data can then feed up and be showcased as as an example of where in a, in a place um, communities can benefit, practitioners can learn in a, from a different way of, you know, of kind of prescribing uh, options for people. And again, it's about that integrated funding model. How do we actually build the financial in incentives in the system so that GPs, for example, can see that as an option the, rather than just prescribing medication or a psychological therapy. Um, and, and potentially, you know, putting money, um, having money follow a person. Um, you know, it, the NDIS has started that journey for us in, in, in Australia, but how do we actually create packages of care around a person as opposed to um, moments of treatment? You, you touched on it just before with your example, but it'd be interesting to hear more around these links between sectors as well as so this whole of government approach. Yeah. Where do you think the opportunities are there? Well, I think, look, I think, you know, it's it really starts with, you know, the, the top levels of government with COAG, with, um, with prime ministers and cabinets, with premiers departments who really do take that whole of government approach. Um, and I think, you know, the arts can and should be part of that of that holistic policy approach, just as in the same way that education, employment, social services and other sectors um, are, are having a role. And again, I think it, it really comes down to, you know, having a seat at that table, um, prevent, presenting the evidence in a way that can be translated into policy. Um, and in, in my experience, um, very tangible examples uh, you need to almost make it easy um, and really bring it down to the basics so that, um, you know, I'm not suggesting for any moment that ministers aren't very clever people, but they're very busy people and uh, they need really, really simple solutions served up to them, <clears throat> which potentially can be started and then scaled up. Continue if they work, scale them up. Thank you. Greta, Marianne, interested in your perspective as well in terms of things that could be used to overcome. Because as as, um, as Georgie said, these reviews, these reports don't produce any new um, information, but why hasn't change happened? We're in a unique point in time, um, but it would be good to get an idea of what are this, what do you think is the key stumbling blocks to change and what could we be doing to shift? Mm. Well, um, if, if I can jump in, Faye, I think you know, what I'm seeing at the moment, and this goes to, to Georgie's point, I think across multiple areas of the community is a welcome breaking down of silos and greater coordination and cross-functional approaches to dealing with some of the really big social and, and environmental issues of our time, all of which require good mental health and well-being. And I think this alongside what Christine spoke of, that we are as a nation shifting towards a focus on helping people thrive, not just survive. Um, and 
in fact, also touching on what Minister Fletcher was saying about the vast and compelling evidence base around the benefits of the arts for mental health and wellbeing. I'm hoping that, um, that these elements in terms of taking that more cross-functional approach can flow through to a more whole of government holistic approach to healthcare. And I would say that now we are getting much better at measuring, and I, you know, this is sort of dry, but measuring intangible assets and factors or benefits that might flow from the arts into the individual and their contributing life. And Faye, one, one blockage has been that these intangible benefits, they'll never show up on a ba balance sheet because, well, traditionally you'll, you'd be unlikely to capture the intangible benefits for an audience member's mental health and well-being um, from them going to see a show or um, from, you know, a, you're unlikely to link them going to see a show with an increase in their productivity at work or the patience that they have with their kids and the amount of time they spend with their kids or indeed the attention span of kids in the classroom and the flow-ons from that all of those intangible benefits, we're getting better at starting to look at. So um, as I was saying earlier, you know, without measuring it, we're not appreciating that it really matters, but with our increasing sophistication around data analytics and our appreciation of getting in experts from different domains and disciplines to demonstrate the extraordinary power of the arts on us humans and on our well-being and our capacity to lead contributing lives, we're, we're starting to join more of those dots. So in terms of those blockages um, and the, the points where it's difficult to translate, I, I would say it's about letting the artists do their thing as the benefits are already there. We already have the evidence base. It's about bringing in and integrating mental health practitioners um, in, into the space, into the room. And it's about getting economists and data analysts into the room to not to change anything, but so that we can measure and therefore appreciate the extraordinary benefits of the arts on mental health and well-being and, um, and their flow on to what it means to live a contributing life, not just for us individually or our communities, but also our society and, and economy as a whole, especially as we come out of COVID. Can I, can I jump in here and get a little bit punchy? Um, there's two, two major blockage, blockages for me. It's the way the system is funded. We're funded for transactions. We're funded for episodes of care, things like bed days, et cetera, et cetera. We're not, uh, and the funding actually um, almost sets services up to compete with one another it's, and not actually collaborate. There's a lot of short-term funding. The second issue, I think, is the second barrier is that, again, mental health and well-being is seen as a health issue, and that's how it's funded. And until we change that funding structure, until we really fund well-being and mental health from a social determinants perspective, going back to that data that I cited earlier around the World Health Organization and the contribution of non-health sectors to people's health outcomes, I mean, that, those two are the big structural things. The way funding is organised and incentivises practice and the, and the way that actual, um, you know, the way that we, we think about mental health is just a health problem. Thank you. I wasn't sure if somebody else was also keen to... I'd say yeah. something there. Um, I could not agree more. I absolutely love what, what you just said there. And I think um, to reflect back on what I said before about survival mode and the disease model, we do need structural change and we need to shift our attention from um, those transactional exchanges to what a well-being interconnected um, paradigm would look like. And, um, and I think um, one of the most important parts of that is to reflect on um, we need to move forward um, with baby steps, only small changes required, but to keep our focus not on what was broken, but on what we can create and where we're moving towards. Um, coming from a hierarchy where I'm working uh, intimately with the client and there's a whole level of systems until I get to a policy maker who can fund what the client actually needs. Um, we're addressing this right now um, in this this beautiful environment with people like yourselves that where policymakers are turning up with a keen interest 
on what they can do differently. Um, as an advocate for my client, I need a manager that I can go to and say, um, I need a, a food hamper for my client. Um, I need to fund, uh, um, certainly it would be helpful if she had a mental health plan, but she can't get in to see a psychologist for six months. So what sort of things can I wrap around my client today? Um, in the program that I was working in, in uh, ANFPP and birthing in our community, um, in Indigenous culture, we already have a prototype for doing that. So when we run community days, we might have a psychologist sitting waiting who our clients would never go to if it wasn't for the relationship that we're creating with them in the kitchen where we're feeding them and talking to them and welcoming them. And they start opening up about their mental health and go, well, you know, Greta's down uh, in her room down here. Why don't you come down with me and we'll engage her and see what's different. Um, Greta, I would say to you also um, about the imminency of evaluating change in our clients. One of the things I would do with our mothers when they would come to community days is have a, a sphygmo, um, a blood pressure machine on the table and I would take their blood pressure, their heart rate, maybe even their blood sugar level when they arrived stressed out of their minds and then we would feed them. Uh, we might bring our physio in to do some dance and movement. Um, we have um, staff that are, are picking up their babies and cuddling them and asking them how they are. We have a table full of artwork uh, where they can determine what, what they want to do. Um, a psychologist, a GP, a, a raft of people there imminent waiting for them, um, accessible and available to help them. By the end of the day, when I would evaluate their physiological well-being without fail, there was a significant change. Now, if I can document that and feed that to my manager upline and she can take that further up, if we can partner with universities, students that will take that information, collate it um, and uh, develop evaluation programs with it, here we are, we're in the midst, we're rolling into a wellness paradigm. It's happening and there's a tremendous momentum occurring. Um, this is happening and what we really, um, really need to, to focus on and endorse is that Aboriginal philo phil phil uh, philosophy of Kenyini, of interconnectedness, of joining the dots, that the more we can work together and collaborate, um, then the faster we're going to move forward, the, the more significance this paradigm shift will, will take on for the people who need us most and most vulnerable. Marianne, what you're describing is that classic moment where first people's knowledge systems, you know, millennia old, somehow seem to intersect with cutting edge academic knowledge <laughs> of, and absolute common sense on the ground best practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Quantum physics, not Newtonian science of separateness. <laughs> We're talking about quantum physics and an infinite field of possibility and potential. And right now we're feeling elated, we're feeling elevated emotions, we're not separate, we're, we're all in this together. This is what creativity is, this is what arts and well bring, uh, being bring to the table. And every time we invest in this, we're a step closer to creating a wellness paradigm. Marianne, I think I've just fallen in love with you. <laughs> I don't, I think because that's what we you. want, Greta. If I've got a client True. who's stuck, who's traumatised, <laughs> who can't move forward, I pull out Greta Bradman's uh, Pan Labyrinth's Lullaby. We're all weeping within seconds. Our hearts are open. We're flooded with oxytocin. We're in love and we're moving forward together. We're well. So I'm not worried if they've got a diagnosis or um, what, are you depressed or that's no longer a part of who they are. They're in their future. They are giants and geniuses and full of potential. I knew this would happen. We'd just get into an absolute role as the time's running out. Um, 
but can I just say that we've got a lot of questions. People have asked, where can they go for more information? Where, what countries are doing these things well? Um, where can they find the right ways to describe what they're doing can feed into these um, capture of data and knowledge, even if it's qualitative, not just quantitative. Because, Greta, you described a whole range of things, ways earlier in which people can um, ev capture and evaluate what they're doing so it will feed into something else. I think that needs to be um, worked through. Adrian, maybe you have uh, an idea yes. of where, what um, goes next. Yes. I mean, just a brilliant conversation. But just on that note, um, I think we've all talked about the possibility we have right now. There are a whole lot of things coming out of challenging times together. The Product Productivity Commission has called this out. But to answer the question about information, I mean, as Georgie has said, there are, there are countries like the UK and Canada who have put a great deal of thought into it. I think of the kind of tackling loneliness strategy that the UK's signed off on where they've got nine government departments 60 recommend working on this through an act of government coordination. So there are some very good examples. So I would say two things. One is the way we are designing the summit we will have in Canberra early next year is to do the thinking around policy, to make it simple in the best sense, as Georgie has already outlined to us, to bring other people to the table to start thinking about coherent policy, which the Productivity Commission has called out. And indeed, as has the Prime Minister, this has got to go way beyond the medical system as part of the solution. So that, that's a practical step we'll take. I'll work with my colleagues as, as we um, land things on our own website to try and build a resource centre where people who are interested in this can go to get some good thinking and some good indications about how they might best do their own research. And as I say, we are working with three university partners at the moment to try and bring uh, a really cohesive evidence base together. That's great. Can I just ask, um, Evan, just one last contribution. For you today, the one big thing, the one takeaway that you'd like people to have from this conversation. Can I kick off with you, Marianne? I'd like to say for anybody out there who um, is is feeling the impact of um, the stress and the trauma or has a diagnosis, um, to see yourself as much more than that, uh, to, to see yourself on a pathway to transformation and wellness, to immerse yourself in the arts and creativity. Um, you've got this, you know, take a breath, walk in nature. Um, find somebody to to care. Um, you know, we can't go back. We are on the threshold of birthing ourselves into a new paradigm of, of well-being and it's going to be more magnificent than you can ever imagine. So don't give up. Keep moving forward. Thank you, Marianne. And Greta? I would just, I suppose, remind us all that, you know, we, we are all broken and we are all whole. And there is a vast evidence base out there as to how the arts can really contribute meaningfully to mental health and well-being. And I am so excited about the, the leadership that Australia can show in this area. Thank you. Georgie. I just want to say a huge personal thank you to the industry, to the sector. Um, in the last 20 months, it was your joy that brought me joy in my moments of the greatest, you know, areas, times of loneliness and despair and exhaustion. And I think, you know, my experience has been replicated millions and millions and millions of times. So how do we harness this, this experience, this collective experience of the joy and, and excitement and connectedness that the arts and creative industries bring to our mental health and well-being and how do we take this irresistible moment and turn it into something that's actually going to change people's lives thank you adrian your one uh, big takeaway i think i'm a bit speechless uh i think we should think about mental health and well-being as we do about physical health and well-being. We need exercise for both and arts and creative engagement provide great exercise. 
<laughs> Thank you all. Um, and on that note, um, I will hand back to you, Adrian, to finish things off of what has, I think we'll all agree, been a really enjoyable and informative discussion this morning. Thank you. Uh, indeed, Faye, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the panel a great deal for a very rich uh, conversation, which doesn't surprise me at all, knowing the panel members, but we have a lot of work to do off the back of that. As I mentioned earlier, um, our forum today supports a longer conversation that will be developed uh, in the Arts, Creativity and Mental Health Wellbeing Summit in early 2022. Uh, we'll seek to bring about a new policy frameworks and initiatives to support the connections between arts and well-being uh, across a wide range of portfolios, First Nations, young people, social services, aged care, regional development and defence that are doing some interesting work in this area as well. Uh, we've created a new resource centre on our website. We will keep that updated um, so that it's a service to the sector and the broader industry. And after this, as I said, we will post uh, a number of case studies on video, short videos of the great work that is being done by so many of the organisations uh, that we fund and indeed other organisations. So there's a lot more to say, but there is uh, much more work <laughs> to do. And the Australia Council really looks forward to that work and to supporting others. Um, I want to thank the Minister for joining us today. Uh, and for supporting this initiative. I want to thank Christine Morgan for her wise and, and deeply encouraging words uh, and thank Rachel Healy and my other colleagues on the Creative Economy Task Force and to Marion Wobke, Greta Bradman, Georgie Harmon and Faye Akindiani, thank you indeed uh, for a really enlightening discussion. I would also like to extend my thanks to our university partners, the University of New South Wales, the University of Melbourne and the University of Sydney. We'll be working with them after this forum. And to our wonderful Ausland interpreters, um, thank you for your contribution, your vital contribution to this forum. I want to acknowledge and thank Fourth Wall for uh, being our delivery partners who we've worked with um, so well in the past. Thank you for all your great work uh, to bring this forum to a broad audience. But above all, I'd like to thank the thousand plus people who have joined us online to listen to this. Hope you draw inspiration from it. But above all, I think this is a wonderful way to think about the work we do. We have a huge contribution to make to some of the most critical policy challenges that governments face, and we can articulate the case really well. So I look forward to joining you all in person. I do want to thank Kristen Cornell and Celia Pavlyev from the Australian Council have done so much work to bring this to you. They won't be calling them out, but I thank them for all the work they've done. And I look forward to catching up with everyone here, either online or preferably in person down the track. Thank you all very much. my
Thank you.